Also, thank you for joining us online too, church. It's so good to have you. We had a great first nine o'clock message. Uh, I was telling the team, you know, what's going to be weird now is is preaching more than once again because I got you know I got kind of like digging the whole idea that I record it once. But let me tell you something. There's nothing like being with people, right? There's nothing like being with people. <clears throat> Just the potential that I might make a joke and I can hear you guys laugh. That was a joke. Just got down. That was a good one. No, that, that wasn't a joke. But it, that helps just to know that you're in here. And uh, so it's just, and then of course we need to be together. You know, the body needs to be together. So um, yeah, praise God. I, uh, <clears throat> I was thinking the other day as I was preparing for my message, what did we do? before the day of uh, GPSs and uh, Google Maps. I guess, we had, I guess we had regular paper maps, right? I remember seeing my dad's like in a glove department or in a back seat pocket, you know? <clears throat> like, what is this? I was driving recently on some back roads and I lost connection. So I got a little lost because the GPS, there was no cell phone towers out there. So I thought maybe I'll look at the stars, you know, and try to navigate back home that way. But I'm not a sailor, so I wasn't any good at that either. But I, I just want to illustrate something for you when it comes to GPSs, because have you ever been to a gas station or a Wawa or something like that to get directions from someone? And maybe there's like two people there, like a married couple, and you ask for directions and they both have conflicting directions. And you're like confused. You're like, okay, I'll move on to the next couple. <laughs> I'll move on to the truck driver who delivers things, you know. Well, recently for the past few months, you know how I've been feeling? I've been feeling like 10 people are giving you the wrong directions. Doesn't it feel like that right now? Like no one knows what's really going on. No one knows what to do. People are more confused than ever. There's so much misinformation. There's so many mixed messages. To be honest with you, church, it's frustrating. And it's overwhelming. And so we all need a vacation from it, don't we? That'd be great. Can we just all go on a vacation? But the reality is we can't. We have to actually go through this. We actually have to go through it. We need to go through it. And we need to do it the way Jesus wants us to go through it. And here's the cool thing. We're going to get through because Jesus is going to help us get through. Amen? Oddly enough, this confusion that we've been dealing with actually makes Jesus shine. Because when everyone else is confused, Jesus isn't. Like Jesus never changes his mind. Jesus never made an edit into chapter 7 of John and said, oh, by the way, I messed up. This is what it is. God will never do that. What was said and what was recorded is what's going to remain because Jesus isn't confusing. Is he hard to understand? Sure. But does he confuse people in the sense of direction and clarity? No. And he isn't confused as a leader, as a as the hope of the world, he isn't confused. He is clear. Let me explain to you what I mean. Go to your Bibles and go to John chapter 14. And we're going to read 1 through 7. And our sermon title is Jesus is Essential because we're still on our essential series. And Jesus is essential. And this is what God reminded me of this past week as I was reading the Bible. John 14, 1 through 7. And... I want to set you up with context. Jesus is getting ready to depart from the disciples through a very difficult series of events. He's going to be betrayed by Judas. He's going to be denied by Peter. He's going to be crucified on the cross all alone. And um, he's getting them ready to get, to, to be able to go through this hard, difficult series of events. He's leaving them. And so he actually starts off with this line. And I think it's so suitable for us today. John 14, 1, don't let your hearts be troubled, period. He stops right there. Trust in God and trust also in me. 
There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. How many want Jesus to come back like now? Yeah, that'd be nice, right? And you know the way to where I am going. This is what Jesus says. You know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas, the great skeptic, I love Thomas because there's nothing wrong with asking good questions. And, and Thomas is like, no, we don't know, Lord. <laughs> uh, we have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If, he had ar- if you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. The bottom line message here is Jesus is letting them know, his disciples know, that the way to God is through him. And even if I'm not there, put your faith in me as the way, the truth, and the life. And that's all of us today. Jesus isn't walking around with us, right? He's not face-to-face eating food with us, but we're in the same context. We're going through conflict. We're going through strife. Our world is a mess right now, right? And how comforting is it to get these three words or that one sentence, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Like the way to get through the next series of events is through Jesus Christ. And the bonus is when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you get to be with the Father. You get to find eternal life. I mean, that's the goal. That's what they wanted. For the Jews who he's talking to right now, the goal was to be where Abraham was, really to be where God was. Like they long to be wherever the father Abraham was. That's what the Jews, the Jews, they heard about what is called Abraham's bosom. It is to be alongside God and Abraham, the father of the Jews, right? Father of many nations. And so they're longing for that and they want to be with him. And Jesus is saying, I am the way to get that. But I want to look at just that one sentence before he says about eternal life. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Don't we need that kind of clarity today right now in our world? Because I'm tired of being confused. I'm tired of mixed messages. I'm tired of go this way, that way, do this, do that, do this. It's so confusing. And Jesus is like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, this would be a really bold statement for disciples because they grew up learning that the law of Moses, the, the, the commandments, the first five books of the Bible, which is called the Torah or the Pentateuch, they were taught that that's the way to live, that that's the truth, and then that's where you find life. So Jesus is talking to disciples who think that the law of Moses is the epitome of what you need to know and follow, and Jesus goes, I am all of that fulfilled. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And so this is a very powerful, powerful statement in a very scary time for them that's getting ready to happen. And so I find it very comforting. And that's why he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. And this would speak their language. Like Jesus isn't being, isn't being confusing at all. Jesus is being clear as day because they would know those words, way, truth, and life. They would know them from the law, which is mentioned many times if you look at it in the Old Testament. And they would know that language and go, oh, so Jesus is all the stuff we've been studying our entire life. What do I mean by that? John 5, 39 through 40, Jesus is confronted by teachers of the law and they're trying to question his identity and authority. And this is what he says in John 5, 39 and 40. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. He's saying, look, everything you've been searching for your entire life. And by the way, the the Jewish uh, teachers, they had to memorize the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament by the age of 12. They had it memorized. That's a lot. Anyone read the first five books of the Bible? That's a lot to memorize. And they would know it inside and out. 
And the person who is everything they're looking for is right in front of them and they refuse to believe. But aren't we dealing with that in our own world as well? And even worse now, there's so many religions and ideologies and teachings that it's hard to kind of pick, you know. Well, today I want to make sure we understand that Jesus really is the way, the truth, and the life. Because Jesus actually embodies all of that. Jesus is making I am statements. He's making claims, truth claims about his identity when he says I am the way, the truth, and life. And he isn't just a teacher of these things. He's not just a good rabbi. He actually puts skin on what it means to be the way. You get what I'm saying? Like, if you need to know what truth looks like, if you know what the way looks like or life looks like, you look at Jesus. I love what William Barclay illustrates when he talks about the way. He says, suppose we are in a strange town and ask for directions. Suppose a person gives directions such as, Take the first right and then the second left, cross the square, go past the church, take the third road on the right, and the road you want is the fourth one on the left. Have you ever got directions like that before? I actually have. It was kind of funny. I was like, um, what? <laughs> yeah. The chances are that you're lost halfway through. Now, this is what he says. William Barclay goes on to say, suppose the person we ask says, come, I'll take you there. This is what Jesus does for us. He does not only give advice and directions, Jesus takes us by the hand and leads us. And while he's leading us, he strengthens and guides us. In other words, he does not tell us about the way, he is the way. That's powerful. The way of Jesus is the way we take in this life right now. It's the way we need to take, uh, church. It's the way we need to go. What about the truth? Many have said, I have taught you the truth, but only Jesus could say, I am the truth. There are many ideologies that claim truth, but we believe only Jesus is the truth and his word is truth. John 17, 17 says, when Jesus was praying for his disciples, he said, sanctify them by the truth. In other words, purify, set apart my disciples, help them be holy by the truth. And then he says, your word is truth. We believe that the word of God is the absolute truth. Jesus is absolute truth. Kevin DeYoung, a pastor and author said, if you ever think to yourself, I need to know what is true, what is true about me, true about people, true about the world, the future, the past, about the good life and about God, then come to God's word. It teaches only what is true. That's powerful. We need some truth today, don't we? My goodness, could we use some truth? And then the word life. What does he mean by life? <clears throat> If we're not careful, we can actually overcomplicate this. But the Greek word, which I can't pronounce, if it, when it's translated into English, it means Zoe. And the Greek meaning to Zoe means genuine fullness of life, spiritual life. Now, one way to break that down a little bit better is, is you have, and I won't use the Greek words for it because I can't pronounce them either, but you have biological life. You have the flesh, which is the sinful life, the sin that man wrestles with. And then you have the Zoe life, which is the Christ life. The life that Christ always meant for us to have. You know what Christ is? He's an example of what we're supposed to be. He's the epitome, the blueprint for what life is actually supposed to be. Before sin, in the garden, when everything was great and perfect, that was Zoe life. And then it got wrecked by sin and separation and disobedience, right? And by the way, that's, that's a point there. Like, if we're living in disobedience, we're actually not experiencing Zoe life. We're missing out on what life could really be. That's why John 10.10 10 is one of our favorite verses in Christianity, right? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have Zoe life and have it to the full. This life is above the flesh. It's above biological life. 
Zoe is spiritual life that only we can attain through the Holy Spirit. It's the only way we can experience true life is through Jesus Christ. Jesus, this is what Jesus is saying. I had to write this down because I feel like God gave this for, to me this week. Jesus is saying, I am life as it was always meant to be. True life, true meaningful life cannot be experienced without Jesus. If someone believes they are living life to the fullest, but they don't have Jesus, they are missing out. Life with Jesus is life to the fullest. When people say, I'm living life to the fullest, now I'm going to go, oh, they must have Jesus in their heart. They must, they must know Jesus. Maybe they don't. I was joking earlier in the 9 o'clock service, but my wife and I went to um, a couple of those uh, timeshare presentations. Yeah, I don't know what we were thinking. You know, we're just... Free food, free tickets somewhere, you know. And man, they promise you the life. If you buy in, you get to pick any pool you want, you know, on these three, you know, properties. And you know, you know, I mean, some of you have probably been in them, right? And no, hey, no, hey, if you do that for your job, hey, that's a tough job, by the way. My wife and I were saying, man, that must be hard to do every day, multiple times. They were promising us a life, and the guy goes, So you ready to buy in? I'm like, no. Like, why? Because I have Jesus and I am living life to the fullest without all that and all that debt and all those bills. Amen. He kind of looked at me funny, you know. He leaves. He sends an, a retired pastor that works for the company to come talk to me. So I had to share the gospel with that retired pastor real quick. On uh, how much Jesus has uh, shown me that I need to pay my debt off before I go and do something like that. It was funny. In other words, I don't need the things of this world to live life to the fullest. That's what I'm trying to say. All we need is Jesus. In fact, when you have Jesus, everything else becomes more enjoyable. That's the key. Young people, students, young adults. When we chase the things of this world, you're finding an empty, empty promise. But when you chase after Jesus, you find fulfillment. And I say that because I used to teach a lot of my young, my young, I was a youth pastor for 11 years here, and I would watch them chase after all these dreams, but Jesus wasn't in them, so they were going to be really disappointed. False expectations, false promises. But if we're honest adults, we still do the same thing sometimes, don't we? And we need to be careful. When Jesus was talking to the disciples about, um, talking to them about his body and, his, and the blood and how they need to drink of it, it really confused people, even though he wasn't being confusing. It was just, it was hard to understand. And so a bunch of people left Jesus, a bunch of his followers left and then his faithful 12 or, and some of the women that are following him too stayed by him. And Jesus said, are you going to leave me too? And this is what Peter says. Lord, to whom would we go? Like, where would we go? You have the words that give eternal life, Zoe life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. John 6, 68 through 69. Wow. Jesus had already showed the disciples so much life that Peter was like, I don't want to go anywhere else but you. And then we know that he messed up, right? But then Jesus restores him and reinstates him in ministry. Because Zoe life is also forgiving and gracious and gives second chances, right? And, and Zoe life is the way we're supposed to live life and the way we're supposed to treat each other, the way Jesus wants us to treat people. And I'm going to get into why Zoe life is important for the context of our world in a second, but let me give you some takeaways that we need to make sure we leave with today. The bottom line message of this scripture, because I don't want you to think I'm taking it out of context, because yes, I am looking at those three words and I'm going, we could really use them in our world today, but don't get it twisted. You know what Jesus is saying right now? He's saying the only way to heaven, the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. It's through me is what he's saying. We live in a very pluralistic world where there's many ways to God. It's not true. There's only one way to God. 
We will be accused of being exclusive and being narrow-minded as Christians, just so you know. But don't get it twisted either. Every religion has exclusivity. Every religion, in other words, has things that don't match with other things, and you can't follow one and be okay in the other. In other words, they can't coexist. That's a false promise. Religions can't coexist. It's apologetics 101. There's always exclusivity. In other words, there's always going to be something that if you follow this religion, you can't do that part of that other religion. So someone has to be right. And Jesus is either a lunatic, a liar, or he's telling the truth when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Thing is, is his character backs up that he's the truth. Jesus literally embodies the way, the truth, and the life. I love that because Jesus puts skin on all three of those things. We need examples like Jesus right now in our world, don't we? Do you know that Jesus asked us to be that example in our world? Like not a confused person. Do you know that when things started changing with rules and laws for Dover and Delaware, we didn't change our perspective on when we're going to start? When the governor changed, you know, and opening up earlier, do you know that we stuck to June 14th? Because I didn't want to confuse the church. When we hear from God to be patient, we hear from God to be patient. And so we stick to our word because there's already enough confusion in our world right now. Amen? So we're trying to navigate this crazy, wild time I never thought I would sign up for. By the way, never did you, right? Because it's not just me that's in this. All of us are in it. By the way, one of my biggest concerns during this time was actually people with jobs and, or, well, everyone, almost except for retirees, have jobs, but people who own businesses, that really concerned me, not just the church. I was praying for those who own businesses, who just started businesses. Wow, what a difficult time. But listen, we have to be steady constants in our society right now because we'll shine Jesus. I love this takeaway. I feel like this is from God. Jesus had the integrity that makes his way, his truth, his life trustworthy and reliable. What is that? What do I mean by that? Well, <laughs> he has a proven track record of perfect character. Like he can make claims and have the integrity to back them up. In other words, you're not being lied to, church. You're not being misled when Jesus directs you or instructs you. You're not being misled. He is guiding you. And you can trust because his character is so good, it's so perfect that he's not misleading you in any way or form. Amen? Amen, amen. Because there's people that say, go this way, and then you only find out that they're hypocritical and they don't even go that way. Aren't you tired of seeing that too? What's happening is we're seeing that Jesus really is the only one we can trust. So, let, you know what, I, I, okay, I'm going to say this, this is on my heart. It's not in my notes. There is a lot of chaos going on, but meanwhile, Jesus is just shining. It's like he's rising up out of the muck and the mire and the mud, and he's like, see, all along, you need to put your trust in me. And, he, and, and God's not that kind of God, so don't take it like that. God isn't like, I told you so. He's not like that. He's a, he's a gentleman. But what he's saying is, is, look to me right now. Look to me, church. Look to me, community, because I'm not going to waver. <laughs> I'm not going to change my mind. I'm not going to confuse you. I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. Jesus is the way to think right now. Jesus is the way to speak right now. And Jesus is the way to love right now. And I just want to say real quick, thank you, church, because in the past three months, you could have sent me a number of emails giving me your two cents on how I need to do things. And instead, you were very understanding and gracious, and you prayed for me, and I'm sure you held your tongue multiple times. Thank you for practicing scripture. Um, in case you know, you're wondering, some of those emails took me two to three hours to write because we have a 1,500 plus person church with lots of different opinions and views. And at some point I have to not worry what everyone thinks and just 
do what we need to do. But it makes it helpful when the church is understanding and you're being gracious, and so thank you. Because you really were, and I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Again, life the past three months is like going to a gas station and 10 people are giving you 10 different directions. That's not fun. And so I just said, all right, I don't care what the news says. I don't care what other people are saying. What does God want me to do right now? He's going to lead and guide me. He's going to direct me. He directed entire armies in the Old Testament on what to do every leg of the way. I think he can handle this. And I would encourage us as a church to know how should we be thinking and speaking and treating people right now in our world? Because Jesus, he, was, he, did, he spoke truth and love. And he was gracious and he was honest. And he, 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 the thing about Jesus is while he was gracious, he remained holy. And he still had, had that standard of holiness So it wasn't like, hey, you can do whatever you want because I love you. That's not Jesus, guys. That's not what I see in in the Bible. I see a Jesus who loved you enough to hold you to a standard. I see a Jesus who loves me enough to hold me to a standard that is good and right. And I find that standard in the world and the word of God. When I read John 14, 6, I also get this takeaway. In a world of chaos, Jesus remains a steady constant. I need, I need some consistency right now. Please, Lord, help us. Right? We need some consistency. We need some, some constants in our life, and in Jesus is that. If there are confusion in lies, Jesus isn't in it. Because he is the way and the truth. There isn't a bunch of ways. There isn't a bunch of truths. There's only one. It's Jesus. And by the way, when you read the Bible and you hear my notes right now, one of the hardest things you're going to have to do is read the Bible and translate it into today's context. Because in the Bible, you're not going to find any of our governor's names, what they're sending us. You're not going to find anything that any leader or any news station is saying what you're going to find is, is truth, convictions, and principles that we can apply to our context today. And that's why Bible studies can't be five-minute, one-verse-and-then-pray kind of Bible studies. We have to look at the Bible and go, okay, how does, this, how does this translate into America 2020? Like, we need to sit down with our kids and go, hey, kids, this is what Jesus would do in this situation. Even though there wasn't bicycles back then... When that kid cuts you off and then says a mean word, this is how you handle it. Because the Bible says, do unto others as you have them do unto you. Forgive, love your enemies, pray for them. You see what I'm saying? Half the time that you're studying the word of God this week, you're going to have to figure out how do I apply it to the context that we're living in. That's just the way we do it as believers. That's what we have to do. If there is despair and destruction, Jesus isn't in it because he's life. And I'll, go, I'll give you these last three takeaways quickly here so I can close. And there, everything's on the after the sermon outline on our website, on the Grow page of our website. The way of Jesus keeps you on righteous paths. The way of Jesus keeps you on righteous paths. This is so important because the church is getting a little pulled into certain paths. And they may not be righteous. Make sure we check are living at the door of God's word. Make sure we check our thinking and our speaking at the door of God's word. The truth of Jesus keeps you grounded in unsettling times. When things are shaky, the truth of God doesn't change just because the world is changing. And then lastly, the life of Jesus keeps you encouraged and shining. Shining the light of Christ, shining the hope of Christ, right? Like, this one really hits me <clears throat> because I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired of what I'm seeing. I'm tired of the pain and the hurt, the overwhelming. Anyone else, like, feel overwhelmed by all that's going on right now? It's, it's exhausting. 
I do notice that that increases the more I watch the news, just so you know. Like, what I feed myself matters right now. I just want you to be aware of that. Because I'm, I'm hanging out with my neighbors of every color, of every nationality, every age. And we're, you know, we're outside talking across the street next to each other or whatever. And we're having a blast. And it's like, it's like the news doesn't even exist. I went to the beach on Friday. I wish every person who's, like, struggling right now, and I mean those who really do, like, legitimately are struggling and they need help, and those who are like causing riots that shouldn't be and all the strife, like the people who are making it worse for everyone, I wish they would all just go to the beach for a day and enjoy a nice, beautiful day at the beach. It fixes things, you know what I'm saying? But we're so caught up. We're so caught up in, the, in what's going on. I just want to encourage you to take a vacation for a few hours from the chaos and give your mind a little break. Because we need a peace and a pasture to rest in. Because, you know, John 10.10 10 is a really good verse, but do you know what John 10.9 says? John 10.9 says, and this is Jesus saying, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. When I picture a pasture, I picture a really nice green field, rolling hills, sunlight, probably some butterflies, some birds singing, maybe one of those really awesome trees out in the middle of the field that you can go sit under, right? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I'm imagining that right now, right? Like that's what we need in our hearts right now because it's been draining. It's been hard. It's been confusing. Well, the scripture that Jesus brought to me this week was Psalm 23, and I want to close with that. And I want you to close your eyes. I want you to listen to the Zoe life that comes from God Listen to the direction, like the way and the truth that he's talking about in it. Here's what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. In other words, your caretaker. I lack nothing. Praise God for that. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And now I love this, I love this next sentence. You prepare a table before me, and the image there is food and nourishment and abundance. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In the midst of chaos and conflict, God, you prepare a table for us. Thank you. A place to fellowship and dine with you. Thank you, God. And only those who seek out God can experience that kind of peace and nourishment. He says, you anoint my head with oil, which is a sign of favor and blessing. My cup overflows. It's not empty. When we go the way of God, when we go in the way of, of Jesus' life, when we follow the life, our cup overflows. Church, our church has been overflowing with blessings in the past three months. It's only God and the obedience of his people that we could take care of families, feed more people than we have ever fed, stay on track with accomplishing our dream goals and renovations in the church, put 40 grand into our principle of our mortgage since February. Which is making us three payments ahead in our mortgage. It's only God. It's only God that, that he would fill our cups with our lives with joy, it's, it's, I know some of us have been hurt. I know that we have seen some damage through the past three months, but many of us have still thrived in the midst of this. And if you haven't, that's okay. That's okay. Because we all have different journeys, right? And we're all growing. But God ultimately as a whole has been blessing this church in the midst of a chaos. Our giving is up. Our, our serving is up. Hopes are up. 
How, how can people be hopeful in this chaotic world we're living in? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Zoe life, life that nothing else can provide except Jesus. Let me finish this scripture. Verse six, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Let me stand together. Thank you, God. God, we worship you right now. We just thank you. God, you have been good. This has not been an easy journey at all. Many of us, Lord, have had to go through some of the most difficult times of our lives. But God, we choose to say we are blessed and you are faithful. God, we're going to look back and go, man, we made it through. I am stronger now than I've ever been because of you, God. Your testing develops perseverance, and perseverance develops maturity. God, we are stronger, not because we avoided this chaos, but because we embrace you in the midst of the chaos. And God, we will continue to do that because you are the way, the truth, and the life through this season. And we can't get a vacation from it, but we can find peace in the midst of it because of you. We can find a table prepared for us. We can find our cups overflowing because, God, you're not affected by what our world is going through. This world can't change you. This world can't change your protection and provision. Nothing can touch you. Nothing can manipulate you or change you, God. You are sure about who you are. Your son Jesus was clear on the way to you and the way to live was the way that he does. So God, we find peace in the midst of the confusion. We find clarity and it's in Jesus Christ. And we declare today that Jesus is essential and always will be essential in our lives and in our family's lives. And God, we will appoint people to Jesus because he is essential to get through this season. In the midst of all that's going on, Jesus is rising up. Jesus is shining. And the world will see that Jesus is the answer. God, we look to the sky as a song says, for you draweth nigh and you come. And you're going to show up. So we look to the sky. We look to you, Lord. Our hope comes from above. Not, nothing on this earth. God, we, we are not going to put our trust in anyone or anything in this world. You get it all. Ultimately, God, it comes down to whatever you want to do right now. So we put our trust in you, just as, your, just as your son Jesus said to the disciples before a very difficult time, we will do that. We will trust in you. We love you, God. God, help us to be in our words and in prayer and listen to you more than anyone else so that we can stay on the straight and narrow, the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's give God glory and praise. Thank you. Praise you, God. Praise you, God.